Y'all, welcome back to Kentucky Fried Wargaming, where two guys who aren't qualified to talk about anything decide to talk about a game with hard math and chance. I'm Joe. And I'm John. And we're back this week with a topic that has been near and dear to John and I's heart for uh, for quite a while. And uh, it's something that we love to do on a smaller scale. And in kind of talking to other people about how they engage with the hobby and how they play games, it turns out it, it seems to be maybe that it's a, a more common practice than we expected. Is it beer, pretzels, and chicken tenders? Well, that's ubiquitous, John. You can't escape it in the hobby. It's why it's one of the best on the face of planet Earth. But no, it's uh, gaming for an entire weekend, as opposed to just like getting together for a single night. Um, You know, because we can't help ourselves and we're gluttons for gaming. Um, Yeah, and, and having a nice weekend of just fantasy is fantastic. Yeah, I see so for us, generally this is something that we do because... Uh, our friend group is kind of scattered all over. We got some people here in Northern Kentucky. We got a number of folks down in Central Kentucky. We got some friends in like uh, Central Ohio in the Columbus area. We got some that are way up north in Cleveland. And uh, it's kind of hard to get people that far together. So we end up just doing it for long periods at a time. And we thought that was kind of unique to us. But kind of looking around, seems like it's probably not. And... um Given that realization, we thought maybe we'd do a whole episode talking about, you know, gaming for a, for a weekend at a time, and the challenges that come with it, and what you can do to fix them. And what we've done in our experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because uh, I will say, it's something that you just got to kind of learn by doing, and uh, figuring it out on the way. And if we could save you some of the things that uh, we have encountered or have heard of, I'd like to. Maybe make it a little less painful for you. But first, hobby progress in games played. Alright, John. Hobby progress in games played is going to be a little weird this week. Why is that? Uh, because we haven't played games other than during our big game day and we haven't been doing hobby progress because we've both been very busy people john what have we been busy doing house stuff and life oh my god that's the truth you get a cookie um okay i, I like cookies <laughs> uh for folks out there who maybe didn't listen to uh our last week's episode um we are moving John and I are moving into our first houses, and uh, our editor Seth is also moving into a bigger space. And uh, y'all, that makes it a little hard to hobby, because all the hobby stuff is currently in boxes waiting to be brought to the new house. So we couldn't really do hobbying, because there wasn't hobbying done. Um, and we do apologize, but hopefully y'all can give us a little bit of a break after 42 episodes at this point. Um, it's something. It's an amount of episodes. We're we're doing our best. Uh, however, we did have a huge game day bef just before we packed everything uh, to celebrate our buddy Tanner's birthday. Uh, he has he doesn't have people to play AOS with up where he's at, and uh, he's really interested in AOS and he even has an AOS army. He just doesn't have anybody to play with him. So we decided for his birthday that. Uh, four of us, or five of us, yeah, five of us, would get together for his birthday, and we would play AOS all damn day. Whole day. And uh, we figured it'd be fun to tell you about the games that we had then to make up for our lack of hobby progress uh, due to our uh, moving indisposition. That was a big word there, John. I'm a professional a podcaster. Word. I'm surprised you use that big word. Uh, I'm surprised I use that big word too, but here we are. Yeah, normally you're a dumbass. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we're going to just break them down. And for this week, we're going to tell you about the first games. Because John and I both played, uh, essentially we had three game sessions, if you can call it that. We, had, we got together in the morning around 8.30. And uh, we played a game before lunch. 
So we each played, John and I both played a thousand point game before lunch. Then we went to eat, came back, and then we each played a 2K game before dinner. And then we left and came back. And then we played what can only be described as an asinine game from just after dinner until four in the morning. Um, yes. <laughs> so... Uh, there was a, and we even weaved a narrative together throughout the day, depending on how the matches went, which was super fun. So I think it's only appropriate to start at the beginning. So John, what was your first game of the day? My first game was Skaven versus Orcs. Ooh, what kind right. of Orcs? Or Iron Jaws? Iron Jaws. Okay. Iron Jaws. Big punchy. Yeah, and... there were a lot of Iron Jaws on this game day. You'll come to find. <laughs> yeah, many Iron Jaws. It was a great time. I was very concerned at the beginning of this game that I was like that it was not going great for me. And then there was a turnaround, which I'll get to in a second. But the narrative for this game was that orcs are coming into this forest to fight some Sylvaneth. At some point, they're gonna they're gonna fight some Sylvaneth. Yeah, there was He's a Skaven. <laughs> well, I guess for context, there has been a grudge match between the orcs and the Sylvaneth for a while. Uh, our buddy Corwin. Got uh, Iron Jaws for his first AOS army, and they've gone up against the Sylvaneth a couple of times before this game day and lost every time. Uh, so there was some bad blood, and they were coming to reclaim uh, the victory. Oh, yeah. So, sorry, John. I just feel like we needed the context. Oh, you're good. Uh, the Skaven orcs showing up into this forest to do what Skaven do, and that's just make a mess. Like they, <laughs> Their whole reason for showing up here is to just cause mayhem and to corrupt this area. There, there's no like elaborate plan here. They kind of just pop, they nod their way into this forest and went, oh, well, we're here. It's time to mess with it. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe grab some goodies between the other two factions while their backs are turned. Yeah, and so the Iron Jaws run into them in the forest. As these Iron Jaws are trying to go meet the other Iron Jaws. Well, these Iron Jaws end up fighting the Skaven. And this this fight, I'm so concerned. Because I have played against Iron Jaws multiple times at this point, And every time Iron Jaws has kind of hit my rats and make them turn into tissue paper. Oh my god, they pulp them. Dear lord. There's just, there's no saving. Like, I, I cannot put enough wounds on the table for Iron Jaws and not just go and I eat them. Yeah, our uh, boys look at a group of clan rats and they turn to pink mist. It's this time, bad. This time, I was able to win with the power of the Bing Bong. Oh my God, your damn Bing Bong! The Bing Bong. Uh, so the Screaming Bell's got some rules on it that allow it to do like mortal wounds in an area. Well, I kept getting the mortal wounds in an area, and it can cast spells. And one of the spells does more damage to targets that move slower. And Iron Jaws move very slow. And it is also a Bing Bong spell. Mm -hmm. A Bing Bong spell just means that it's it's sound-based with the bell. And so as these orcs are, like, fighting these Skaven, and, like, I've got Rat Ogres fighting them and doing a bunch of damage, and they're super cool. Love Rat Ogres. Going to keep bringing them. Huge fan. Um, I've got this Scream Bell just, like, throwing out like mortal wounds and I, I kept rolling really high for the amount of damage i would do with my magic and so like me and tanner because i was playing against tanner's iron jaws have the had this entire narrative going in that these orcs were just murdering skaven left and right just killing dozens of rats at a time and all of a sudden they would just look at the direction of the screen bell and it would go bing bong and they would go bing bong and put their hands on their <laughs> head as their heads explode <laughs> Now they're going to be terrified of music. You have given these orcs a, a phobia, John. Oh yeah, it's it's something else for sure. So uh, did you end up winning? I ended up winning that game. And so the narrative we made was that the Skaven will continue on deeper into the forest to see what else they can find. While the Iron Jaws move on into the forest, into the like northern part of the forest into the snowy waste to fight the sylvaneth yeah For reasons we'll get into on next episode of what happened during our game day yeah yeah uh but what about your game joe well i was playing my sylvaneth at a thousand points because every uh john and i had been playing aos recently but uh 
Corwin and uh, Tanner had not. So we wanted to start at a lower point level just so it wasn't overwhelming. So I came with a thousand point list. And while I don't think he's necessarily like the greatest model in existence, I brought my Tree Lord Ancient because that was the grudge match tree from the last few matches with Corwin. Um, so he was my general and uh, he was backed with uh, a whole war band of Sylvaneth. And essentially the narrative was that the Iron Jaws were coming and they were trying to figure out who was the big boss between Corwin and Tanner. Oh, I'm sorry, War Boss Tanzer. And Corwin's War Boss was named War Boss Cheese Whiz. <laughs> like, <laughs> who is the baddest? And uh, Corwin was coming in off of a couple of losses, so he was kind of thinking, like, all right, I'll just go ahead and give it to Tanner. However, we had this narrative that Tan uh, War Boss Cheese Whiz had an idea that the trees lose all their leaves in the winter. And what if without their leaves... They can't do no fighting. Hmm? And if the orcs could come in and crush the Sylvaneth real quickly, maybe they regain some confidence and he would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tanner in game two to see who the biggest boss was. So Big boss. Yeah, so the first game here, we were kind of setting the narrative for what game two would be to determine matchups and stuff. So the Iron Jaws were storming into my sort of snowy grove where the Sylvaneth were wintering. And they were essentially trying to crush him before they could wake up. And he brought a, as all Iron Jaws lists are, a crunchy, punchy list, which was very cool. Um, he had like a, a mega boss on foot and some Ard boys, two units of brutes, some pigs, some big pigs, uh, a, a caster. It was very neat. And uh, we went toe to toe. And he, I. He gave me first turn, so I sort of pushed up, and the Sylvaneth started expanding. They woke up, and, like, uh, my first turn, I dropped three for three little forests across the board in, like, my deployment zone. And then he gave me first turn, so I walked up, and I dropped three more forests, and the orcs went, uh-oh, because <laughs> the trees were not asleep. No. <laughs> uh, we done messed up. Uh... So I got all my forests out, and then I just sort of bunkered down midfield. And the orcs then came crashing into the Sylvaneth and did not do all of the damage that they were hoping to do. Uh, and then the Sylvaneth essentially went, all right, my turn, and clobbered some pigs. Uh, it was bad. It was, it was bad. Kurnoth Hunters killed like three pigs and a unit of six right off the bat uh a tree lord ancient uh started killing some brutes uh other kurnoths on the other side kind of got in an advantageous position i was able to summon some dryads to get ready for objectives um and i sort of like i was trying to bait him to come around to just one side of the board because i knew i could outspeed him and we were playing a game mode where there were four objectives on four different corners. And if you got all four on like turn three and onwards, you would win. So I was kind of trying to put a bunch of valuable stuff to one side to bait him over and away from objectives. And um, it worked. <laughs> so uh, we started crunching and bunching and the trees just hardy as hell. Um their bark was very tough in this winter season, and uh, they would take a, some a little bit of damage, but they could also heal some of their own damage back. So the amount that was being done wasn't very much because it would get healed. And uh, eventually, uh, he got far enough away from the objectives that I owned the two objectives in my territory. I sprinted some dryads to the left objective face in his territory and then teleported... Uh, tree Revenants to the other objective in his territory. And then I had all four objectives. And essentially the orcs had been surrounded and routed. And uh, they shattered and ran away. <laughs> um, and it was a victory for the Sylvaneth. A pretty dominant one. Although, there, I, to Corwood's credit, I'm very impressed. He did have a rather cunning ploy that if it would have gone off, would have been incredible. 
Uh, he did pick up a unit of brutes and throw them into my back line to try to charge and kill my wizard, who was entirely left out. I didn't know he had the teleport. And he went to roll that charge, and he was one inch off. Even with his bonuses. Oh, no. Yeah, even with his bonuses, he had eight. He needed nine. So he was just short. Um, but if he could have made that charge and killed her, uh, I don't know if he would have won, but he, I wouldn't have gotten instant win on turn three. That's for sure. So it was uh, surprisingly close. I think that moment kind of put it in my favor. Um, and when the orcs went running, it was established that they will forever have a fear of trees and a phobia of all things covered in bark. And, uh, and it kind of set our narrative for game two. Because now that Warboss Cheese Whiz has been struck low and he knows he's not the biggest boss, the question becomes, is Sylvaneth the biggest boss? <laughs> and, uh, that meant that for game two, we had the idea that the Sylvaneth would have to tow off against uh, Tanner's Iron Jaws to see if maybe Sylvaneth are the biggest war boss. They are green. They are green. Um, and I will save that for the next hobby progress, but it was a blast of a game. Uh, and I will also say there's something to having a game day where everybody is just super happy to be there. Because um, even the crushing losses uh, were hysterical. And we giggled ourselves silly. Doing terrible orc impressions. Essentially going, uh-oh. Every time a roll went badly for them, <laughs> it was delightful. So yeah, it was a ton of fun. Um, and I had just as much fun game two, and, but it was way more bloody. We'll get to that. <laughs> but y'all, I do want to say thank you for letting us kind of break up this one big day of gaming into a couple of hobby sessions so that we can, you know, move and get new spaces. We appreciate you. And now, on to the topic. Whew. All right, John. So, I guess to talk about this topic, as we always love to do on the show, we should probably start at the beginning, you know, the baseline, ground zero. Nope, we'll start in the middle, and then we'll talk about the beginning <laughs> later. Why are you like this? Um... I think here, though, it's a it's an interesting conversation because I know some people kind of just get together like one night a week or two nights a week and they just play games. Um, so for those people, maybe we should kind of explain why they're like why we prefer to do weekend long game sessions and why some other people do as well. You know, what are the benefits of playing for a whole weekend at a time? <clears throat> and first and foremost, I think. You have to acknowledge that for a lot of people, life is just busy, you know, between uh, partners, relationships, families, jobs, uh, obligations. There's just a lot going on. And it's kind of hard to peel away from that last minute for a lot of people, especially if there's distance involved for how far they have to travel. Um, you know, for like our, our bud Corwin up in the frozen wasteland of Cleveland, uh, it is hard to be like, hey man, you want to like play this Wednesday night? Just make a five hour drive down real casual like and like play a game and then turn around and drive home? Like, that's, that's a big ask. And especially with jobs and stuff. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's kind of rough. And in that... Well, it's also like, even if you have a handful of people that you play with in your like town or city... You can, you know, play a game with them in a weekday or maybe on a Saturday you can fit in a game. But it's different between, it's different from getting, like, all of them together and doing something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's generally just, like, two people at a table rather than a bunch of people hanging out together. Um, and also, like, sitters? Sometimes it's hard for people to find babysitters last minute. Even to just come up for a few hours, that can be a challenge. can be difficult. Um. Or generally just to, like, get out of other obligations. It can be kind of hard to do that during the middle of the week or last minute. Um, and the benefit of having a weekend-long thing is that you're planning it 
far in advance. So you have something to kind of shoot for uh, to make sure that you're free one way or another. Secondly, it means that when you do get everybody together, one, you can have more people around, and two, you could get more bang for your buck in terms of like your time. You know, when if you claw out a night to game, you might get two games in, give or take. Uh, maybe three if you're pushing hard. And you're or if you're playing rushing. something like Kill Team or like Warcry, you can probably get around a lot more, but then you're not getting the big game. Yeah, exactly. Uh, whereas if you come and you carve out a lot of time for a weekend of gaming, like Friday to Sunday evening, you're getting a lot of games. You're getting a ton of games. Uh, you're probably going to play like two, maybe three Friday night. You're going to play a bajillion Saturday and then some Sunday. Uh, you're going to get a lot of games, and if there's a lot of people there, you're going to get them against a lot of different armies and opponents. Which means it's going to be very different. You're going to get to go up against a whole bunch of different flavors of battle types, and it's just going to be good for you. So for that time that you carved out, you got a whole lot of gaming for your effort. And this last one was kind of, well, this last two, I guess, they kind of run together. It was hard for us to kind of put down in a way that does it sound a little weird, but when you just have like a last minute game night, you're kind of just like, oh yeah, cool. I'll go over and I'll play a game. Like, that's fun. I'll never, like, I don't say no to that. That sounds fun. But if you have a weekend event to look forward to, it changes the outlook. Now it's something you're looking forward to down the line, one month ahead, two months ahead, three months ahead, however far you guys out have to plan it. You have something to work towards that entire time. And it will give you, um, at least for us, a whole lot of hobby motivation. You know, you're trying to paint up a specific force for that weekend. Or you're trying to paint some terrain for that weekend. Or, you know, you're trying to base some stuff in time for the weekend. You know, whatever your goal is that you're working towards, it's something you are constantly looking forward to. You know, you're chatting in the group, like a group message about like what you guys are bringing, what you're excited for, what you're thinking about what you're hobbying with, and it kind of snowballs together and makes it a much more impactful thing in your life. Because And it you know builds community. Yes, very much so. Like, there's a whole lot of camaraderie that comes with that for everybody who's going. It's, and, you know, especially if you have, like, 10 to 20 people going, that's a lot of hype that you're building up for each other. And... I think that is hard to replicate with a single night of gaming. It just is. Absolutely. I mean, a single night of gaming is also very rushed. Like, if you get off work at 5, you don't get down to the shop till like, 6 or 7 after eating some food or doing some stuff. Like, you've rushed everything to get that far. Get a game in if you're lucky, and then go home a little late and lose some sleep to be able to play Warhammer in the week. Mm -hmm. Like, that's that's just the reality. Like, <laughs> yeah. And you're gonna you're gonna want to rush through that game as fast as possible, and you might not enjoy it as much. Mm -hmm. I could definitely see that because you feel a little rushed. You're not fully in it. You're not fully relaxed. Um, you might still be thinking about the stuff you have going on outside of work. You might be thinking about like, oh man, I had to leave my partner at home to watch the kids. Like, I hope it's not overwhelming them. Or you're thinking about your job tomorrow. Oh man, I'm gonna be so tired. Oh, I have that early meeting. I'm going to be so friggin' exhausted when I get done with this to get home. And then I got to be on my meeting at 7 a.m. And then I got another meeting back to back until like 11. You know, like it's hard to yank your head out of that space when you're doing it last minute. As opposed to a weekend where I don't think about any of that. That's off the radar. Because it's and like, just relaxed time. And like for us, like we'll hang out the Friday before like a Saturday or a Sunday. Saturday and Sunday of gaming. Like, we'll just go hang out Friday night, maybe play a couple of small games or play some, like, smaller board games or something, and just hang out, and it that's the relaxing. It's like getting rid of everything else to get in the mindset for the weekend. Mm -hmm. That is also very helpful in creating this environment of, let's just have a good time playing these games with numbers and dice like a bunch of nerds. Yeah, yeah. And I also kind of do want to make a quick distinction here that, like, when we are talking about a weekend of gaming, we are talking like anywhere from five people to like 
20 to 25 people that, you know, you're generally in the friend group with. You know, you're inviting, you got an idea of who's coming, and it's a more relaxed setting. We're not talking about like a, a running a, or going to a 500 person GT or other colossal tournament. We're talking that about... That is a drastically different endeavor. Yes, <laughs> I cannot tell you how different it is to set up one of those to this. And I mean that literally. I cannot tell you because I've never run a 500 person GT. I imagine it's a nightmare to set up. And you're going to need the a closest, whole lot of help to do that. The closest we've gotten to running like a big event full of strangers is running LARP events for about 100 to 150 people. Yes. Uh, that would last all weekend. Yeah. You know, so like we have some event planning experience, but not quite to the level of gt or lvo <laughs> yeah we have never had to run an event for 500 people uh i can't what was our maximum of people on site 156 one event i think i think i think we pushed 170 like yeah one of our august games but never yeah. 200 and above um which is you know get what gives us some of our experience for some of the stuff we're going to get into later but when we're talking about running this weekend thing everything we're saying is for a more casual uh, non-competitive environment, or if it is competitive, it's with people you know, or who are adjacent to people you know, you know, friend of a friend sort of deal, and not a general tournament for all comers. Um, that comes with different advice. I figured we'd set that level before we go on forward. Um, otherwise, some people are going to be like, your advice is garbage for 500 people. Like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> you, you'd be correct it is actually garbage if you're trying to run a 500 person tournament. you're very correct sir you got me there um, here's your internet cookie it's just for you <laughs> but even with running you know this more we'll call it a personal get together okay i'm gonna use that term even with running a more personal get together for people a weekend long get together there are some challenges to make it work there just are and i think We've kind of said a whole bunch of reasons why we like it and why it's fun, but it would be remiss of us to not briefly talk about some of the things that could add a little bit of pressure to the weekend, act as a roadblock, act as a stressor. And then after we go through those things that could be a little difficult, don't worry, we're going to give you advice on how to counteract them or how to just avoid them altogether. Because we want you guys to be armed and equipped to do this if you want. You know, if you want to, like, get your hobby group together, especially post-COVID, you know, you probably haven't seen each other in a, a while. You know, this can be your olive branch to bring people back in. Uh, and we want you to be as successful as you can be doing that. So y'all can have the most fun that you can in three days. So I think the first challenge with doing a weekend long get together is having enough space for everybody to get to actually get together and hang out. And of course, the severity of this depends on how many folks are coming. You know, if you got six people coming, that's a lot easier than having 20 people coming. It's, you know, this is something that gets more difficult the more folks that you have coming in to play games with you. And if you do not have... Uh, space sort of in your house for all these people, you're going to have to go outside of your house somewhere. An event center, a game store, or whatnot. And depending on where you're at, that might be a difficult search. And it also could increase the cost of this weekend by a significant m margin. Yeah. Because um, like when we have a, like a personal get-together, we're not like charging people for stuff. But if we have to rent out somewhere, well, you got to split that cost amongst everybody. Yeah. Uh, it just is what it is. And then I think tied to that is sort of, this kind of piggybacks on it. Second, you need a lot of terrain for multiple tables. So much terrain. God, you need so much so terrain. So much terrain. Uh, and you cannot just buy all of it from GW. I'm just going to tell you, like, you're going to be spending too much money if you just buy all the GW terrain to be able to play, like, some games. Either 3D print some stuff go buy some stuff from like a pet store for like aquarium stuff. That's great for fantasy and some of the sci-fi stuff. Uh, Etsy uh, for like other people to 3d print it for you in bulk. Uh, make some like stuff, which go to a Michael's and go wild with it. Mm -hmm. like just <laughs> But one way or another, you're going to have to get a bunch of terrain. Now, if you are renting out a local game store, 
they might have some terrain there and it may fix your problem or alleviate it. But if you are getting together with people and again, this scales, depending on how many folks are coming, you might need more or less. If you're getting together with a bunch of people, you're going to have a lot of need for terrain and you probably don't just have that sitting on your shelf. And, uh, if you don't have enough terrain for all of your tables, let me tell you, that's a giant friggin' monkey wrench in your weekend. Yep. Yep. That's the quickest way to make some people angry is when they show up to play at a table that's got half the amount of terrain they expect. Or maybe no terrain on it. Like, yep. that's bad time. I've I've had that happen. It's uh it's kinda rough. And third, I'm just gonna call this logistics. Because there are logistical things that are going to pop up that you have to be thinking about before everybody gets together. So let's just hit you with a couple. And I'm sure there's more that we aren't even thinking about. And there might be even more depending on your group and who's coming. But first thing, where's everybody staying throughout the weekend? You know, are they all crashing at your place? Are they crashing at somebody else's place? Are they doing hotels? We all staying in cars in the parking lot? Who knows? Yeah, I mean, been there, done that. I get it. Uh, two, <laughs> you know, how are they getting to and from the, wherever they're staying to the place where you're going? Did they all drive together? Are they carpooling? Are they Ubering? Did they rent something? You know, how is everybody getting around? Three, not only how are they getting around, what about all the armies? Cause everybody's presumably bringing an army, maybe two and they're where are you storing them. Yeah. Where are you storing them? <laughs> Where are you, are you, do you have enough car space to bring all that and faction terrain and maybe the actual terrain? If y'all are bringing that, like, do you, do you just have enough space in the vehicles to get them there to where you're going? Uh, four. All right. You got everybody to the game store or wherever you rented is, is there a bathroom around there? Like, do you, do you have a bathroom? Do you, or if you have like 20 to 30 people. Is one bathroom enough? Like, is it working? Had that happen. Um, yeah, yeah, we have. We have had that happen. Had that happen. <laughs> one bathroom, a bajillion people. Bathroom didn't work. Causes problems. Um, and, you know, fifth. All right. Everybody's there. They can use the facilities, we'll say delicately. Uh, what are y'all eating? Like, do, yeah. do you have food yeah, the... to feed these people who showed up? Um, uh, in our experience, the second food becomes an uncertainty at an event for anything, people immediately go, I don't want to be here. Yep. Like, I got to go. <laughs> like, <they're, laughs> uh, we, we you know, we've ran events in the past where their, their food was very not reliable and m- many people just went, I'm getting up, I'm leaving. I didn't know I had to bring my own food because we didn't realize things were wrong. And then there was no food. <laughs> and then people were like, well, I'm just going to go home then. Like, I'll see you. Mm-hmm. I'll go get, I'll eat on the way home. Uh, not going to be hungry. So, like, figure that beforehand. Like, whether you cater it at somewhere like a, like a, like a t- chicken tender place that love to cater food. Maybe you decide to get weird and just order 40 cheeseburgers from Wendy's. Mm-hmm. Or you have somebody make food or make it a potluck. Yeah, maybe you're barbecuing. Whatever. Maybe people are uh, bringing food. Uh, maybe you're good, just going to grill out outside the game shop. I've seen that happen. That's cool. Um, maybe you have a scheduled lunch break and a dinner break where you go to, out to go eat somewhere all together. Uh, wouldn't necessarily suggest it because it takes a ton of time, but you, know, you do you. It's also an option. Whatever fits it's for your weekend. Uh, but yeah. simply put, it's a challenge. And if you don't think about it and it catches you last minute, you're going to have issues. And then six, what are people drinking? You know, do you have like beverages? Does this place sell them? If not, are you bringing water or soda or whatever? You you got a cooler? If not, are you just gonna like run to the gas station over and over to get drinks and stuff? Like, and, and like with beverages, you gotta ask like, are you going to allow drinking if it's your own house? Are you going to like alcohol? Mm-hmm. You know, are you going to allow, are people are going to be okay with that? Is everyone aware that this is a thing where people might be having beer while playing? Some people aren't comfortable with that. Some people are. Like, these are things you have to think about ahead of time, even if that's not necessarily a problem for you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of this is probably stuff that you wouldn't consider because it seems kind of rote. But uh, 
And it is kind of rote when you just got like four people coming over to hang out. It is. Like a lot of this stuff you don't even worry about because you're just hanging out at the house. It's fine. But as you get larger and larger numbers of folks outside of the house somewhere, you know, it matters more. <laughs> it, it it matters. And also, you don't think these are problems until they become a problem. Like, you don't question whether about the guy who brings a six-pack of beer to play Warhammer with everybody because he never gets weird. But then maybe he brings his buddy, and his buddy has a flask of whiskey on him and also just drinking a 12-pack of, like, Natty Light and walked in the door with a tall boy and is getting really sloppy by, like, four hours in. And is making it real awkward for a lot of people. Like, some people aren't okay with that. Like, some people can't handle that and will want to just go home now and maybe won't want to come back to another event. Mm -hmm. And it could get ruined very quickly just because expectations weren't set. Yep. I mean, there are challenges you got to consider if you want to have a fun weekend. Um, Now, depending on how well you know everybody who's coming, these will be easier to fix than if you don't know everybody, you know? Some of these just might not be a concern. If you know, if everybody comes, your buddy, you know, if it's like a 12 person event and all of them are like personal friends, you, you're probably going to be fine. But you already hashed this out in other situations. Like you'll be fine. But just think about it. And now that part probably sounded a little down because these, you know, those things above are challenges. I grant you that. However, I would argue that with a little bit of effort and pre planning, they are not showstoppers. So now let's get into how to fix those and how to make sure you have the maximum amount of fun for your effort. So first and foremost, you should book wherever you're going to be playing far ahead of schedule. And when you set the date, do not move it. Come hell or high water, do not move it. Yep. Don't. Just just don't. If somebody, like, something happens in their life and they have to change, maybe it's your best friend, that sucks. Um, They can't make it. You can't change the whole event for everybody. People take time off work. People have to get babysitters. People need to make, like, maybe they need to build and paint an army before this. Maybe they need to build and paint some terrain before this. There's a lot that goes into this. So when you set the date and set up the plans and have everything made and some things change is okay, but don't ever change the date. Yep. Um, that is how you make people mad and not want to in- engage with this kind of like event again. Uh, it just it doesn't work out well. Yeah, especially does not work out well with like ever. work vacations. Once those are set, a lot of workplaces it's hard to shift them. You know, they're done like two months, three months in advance, and if you keep kicking the date around, man, no one can plan for that. So just. Book it early and stick to your guns. And when I say book it, if it's an outside place that you're booking, I mean that literally. Like, you have to call them and book it and whatever else you got to do for a deposit. But if if you're at, even if you're at someone's house, when I say book it, I mean make everybody in that house aware of what's happening. So if you're going to your buddy's house and you're all playing there in the basement, you set up a couple of tables. Uh, you know, if if he's married... Do they know? <laughs> you know, you don't want to surprise the other people living in the house. You know, do the chitlins know? Or anybody else who may be staying there? Do they all know? Are they cool with it? Are there any objections? You know, and if there are, if they know ahead of time, maybe they could just be gone that evening. Like, it's stuff like this that done ahead of schedule will just fix the entire problem. Like, you, you will have a space guaranteed... And it will be no problem day of. And that's the goal, is to make sure that there is no problems day of. Moving on. For terrain. If if you're gaming at a shop, the terrain issue can be immensely relieved. Because shops usually have terrain all over the walls, they got a bunch of extras, they got stuff everywhere. However... If you're not playing at a place that provides all the terrain for all the tables that you're going to be using, you can do it all yourself, but man, that's going to be tough work. But also... Unless you've already got like a base of stuff, maybe you like have your own table at your house and you've slowly been building up some, some terrain, it might not be that monumentous of a task, um, but 
it's better to spread the workload out than to just try to hammer out a bunch of like subpar terrain. Not to, not to put down anybody's skill, but like if you're used to spending an hour or two hours on a piece and you now have to spend 10 minutes on it, you're going to cut corners in a lot of places. That's going to be visible when playing the game. And some people, it's just not worth that trade off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, that's the nice thing about having these smaller, uh, more personal get togethers is it's not like people are paying to come to this grand tournament GT where they expect you to provide terrain. They're just people, you know, they're buddies. Send out a call and say, hey, y'all, we're going to need six tables of terrain, however many tables you're going to need. If everybody could paint up and bring one to two pieces themed after X, Y, and Z, you know, maybe you roughly tell Roughly this size. Yeah, roughly this size. And let's say we're going to be, this campaign is going to take place in the realm of fire. So think like magma and like obsidian holds and stuff like that and it's going to be fantasy only and blah 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 like you tell them all of that and folks can just make two pieces a person and if you got a dozen people showing up now you have 20 yeah 24 pieces of terrain right there yep and that will help you a ton an absolute ton and you don't have to stress about it and they get to have a little hobby project on the side to get ready for the weekend. And maybe it ties into the narrative. Maybe it's maybe it forges the narrative a little. You know, maybe it's so like they can get creative with the terrain piece. Maybe it's so cool you add it into the story. Whatever you got going on, it can run together. And And like we like we'll we'll use a quick example real quick for this. Like say we want to run a hot orc summer event, right? New orc books coming out. Oh yeah. Uh, for for all the games, <laughs> there's, or, there's orc books, orc books all over the place. So we're gonna have orcs, say, versus space marines on some plan that we've named, and it's a jungle planet, and we need some Imperium stuff. We need some orc settlements, like tribal orc sa settlements. We need some jungle stuff, and we'll make like a, a call in our Discord group of like, hey, everyone who's coming to this event. Can you bring one piece of jungle only terrain, bring one piece of like imperial terrain if you're imperial or orc if you're an orc and say we have 12 dudes. Like you said, that's 24 pieces of terrain and it's the tables are made. Tables are done. Mm -hmm. Like, and no one had to absolutely tables. work themselves to death over it. And as the host, if you want to put in extra effort, maybe you decide you're going to go out into the like the pet store and you go to the aquarium section. You buy a bunch of like those aquarium ruins. You buy like 12 of them as just extras. Okay, cool. You're gravy. Everything's gravy now. Like it's zero, zero worry, zero stress. Now you can focus on painting all those orcs that you need to play this game this weekend. Yeah, exactly. Um, the problem's just solved and you didn't have to do a whole lot of work. And that's what this is about, y'all. Most FUD for least amount of effort. That's the Kentucky Fried Wargaming motto. Um, work harder now so I have to work less later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and all of a sudden your terrain issues are relieved. You're good to go. That whole hurdle just disappears. Instantaneously dissolves. Congratulations, you're back to fun. Then, though... Ye our next piece of advice, I mean, so that kind of gets you ready to show up to play, okay? That means you have a space booked. Everybody knows when it is. They're planning on where they're staying or where they're, like, bringing cars or how to get their armies to wherever they have to be because they have a definitive location. They also know what they have to do for terrain and stuff. So, again, when they get to said location, they will have terrain with them, and it's resolved. Or there will already be terrain there. All resolved. Okay, great. That that gets you ready to be in person and play the game and have a great time. However, there could sometimes be issues <laughs> once you are in person. Sort of uh, inner interpersonal disputes. We'll put it that way. Um, sometimes, and once everybody gets there, you find out that not everybody had the exact same plan for what this weekend was. For example, uh, let's say when you were putting it together, most of the friend group was sort of under the assumption that this wasn't uh, a very, I guess, how would people call it? 
efficient or optimal list building weekend. You know, by other term, maybe it wasn't a hyper competitive weekend. So people brought more fun lists. Maybe they themed them around an idea or a story. And then one person shows up with a ultra tuned tournament ready net list. And all of a sudden they are looking to stomp the entire weekend. Some people, they won't care. They're just like, whatever, you beat me. Congrats. But for others, that's going to ruffle some feathers. And that could have been avoided by having a discussion before anybody ever signed on about what your expectations were for the weekend. Essentially, going back to that thing that we talked about many episodes before and keep harping about, having a quick chat about your social contract. You know, what is the intention for the weekend? What are, you know, what type of lists are we bringing? Are they tuned up? Are they tuned down somewhere in the middle? If so, where? Is there a narrative that we're sticking to for the weekend that we're theming around? If so, what is that narrative? What are the restrictions? Um, same thing for, you know, the terrain stuff. Is there an expectation for you to bring something? If so, what is that expectation? Here it is. You have to agree to it before we leave. Also, do you need a code of conduct? You know, if everybody who's coming is you're like your close friend, you don't, you probably don't need to do that because you know that they're cool people. But if maybe friends of friends are coming, you don't know if that person's cool if you've never met them. So a code of conduct about how to behave when you're there. And yeah, like that's a that's a very important part, and I want to make sure that we hammer this one home. Mm -hmm. That could be possibly the most important part about this is set an expectation for behavior. You know, you and your buddies are probably good if your buddy's brother or, like, maybe your buddy's friend shows up and has an anger problem. That can quickly ruin the good time for everyone, and some people just go home. Um, different political views doesn't mean they can't play a game, but also means that if someone, if, there, if there's talk that you do not want there, do not have that talk there. Um, it can get ugly quick. It can turn into a lot of very quickly into arguments, into this has now turned into four hours of two people screaming at each other and everyone trying to get everyone to calm down. And then that's over. Like, there's no more game. Uh, yeah, weekend fun, ruined. Um, you know, I'm going to say this in a way that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to say it nicely. Most of the people who play this game are white, straight men. Okay? That does not mean that the only people who play this game are white, straight men. <laughs> And there are other groups of people that will sh that should be allowed to come to your events, that are likely going to come to your events, that need to feel safe in that environment as well. And if you have people who show up to these events and cannot abide by the rules that you're setting for this, they do not deserve to be there, and you should not feel bad for enforcing those rules and setting those expectations. Because the act of even setting those expectations and letting everyone know ahead of time will likely prevent any of it from occurring in the first place. Yeah. Um, I mean, just from sort of personal anecdotes, when we did the LARP stuff, um, you would think like that most people don't need to be told all this. And it's true. Most folks don't. Most people show up with the best intentions and they're really cool and they're really chill and everybody's having a good time. Uh, but I can tell you from experience, one person says a slur and the fun is over, y'all. Fun, over. <laughs> yeah, fun, done. Um, and if you do not sort of set the expectation beforehand that we will throw you out. You know, if you do X, Y, or Z, uh, it can be a little rough. Because I will say, when stuff like that happened for us, we knew the plan, you know? And that we, instance, we had a plan going in. <laughs> that person <laughs> is gone. They're gone. They're absolutely gone. There's no and ifs or buts. There's no second chances. You're gone. And because the reaction was so quick and so decisive... It wasn't an issue. Fun kept going. It was totally fine. Um, and the people who did want to follow the rules and wanted to have a good time felt more confident and secure in the ability to have a good time because they knew that should someone, you know, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use an internet meme here. If someone was going to fuck around, they were going to find out very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just, you got to know going in. And again, if this is a small group where all your buds not a problem, y'all. Like, you got good taste in friends. They're cool. Everybody's going to have a good time. But 
in our experience, it's when you branch out further to like the friends of friends or like family of friends. Like you just don't know those people and you got to just be a little safe. Um, yeah. And while I don't think like that last example I gave out, probably not going to happen to you. It's more than likely just going to be someone misunderstanding what type of list to bring. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. I think most people who play this game, especially those who are getting together for like a fun, casual hangout, they're not trying to ruin anybody's good time. They just might have a different assumption. Maybe the group they play with is always playing tuned up, hyper strong competitive lists. And that's totally fine. That's how some people play. And it's a great way to enjoy the game. It's why these huge tournaments exist. And they might just have that innate assumption that this group plays that way. And totally not meaning to hurt anybody's good time, they just show up and do so on accident. Or um, like another example, like maybe you and your group are so, and your meta is so used to playing with, with infantry-based armies and infantry, and we're going to use 40K as an example. And so you bring a lot of like anti-infantry guns and like it's always like, like that. You're not used to dealing with big vehicles, so you don't bring stuff like eradicators or like big guns, stuff like that. And then your buddy's brother said he wants to come play, comes and plays last minute, and he's got a whole knight's army, and no one knows how to deal with that, and no one ever has played against knights. That can sometimes feel real bad. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think, you know, having this little chat about, like, the social contract and expectations just kind of front loads uh, your effort and can sometimes take some of those issues that might be found out on game day that are too late to fix it. And simply make them non-issues. You know, the person who was going to bring a more tuned up list without meaning to hurt anybody's feelings is if you say, hey guys, we're bringing more casual lists that aren't as efficient. It's more about fun than winning. They might just go, oh, damn, I'm glad they said that. I'm going to change my list real quick. And uh, here you go. I'm going to bring this instead. Now, non-issue, non-problem. You're good to go. Everybody's having a fun time. And it also sets the tone for what you want. You know, in that example, you know that everybody's just showing up to have fun. It's more casual. And the vibe will be more casual. Or if you're looking for something that's more tuned up, and it's more efficient, and it's more uh, back and forth, and it's much harder, and that's what you want, then you're going to set that vibe early. And people are going to show up to bring that vibe. And you're just going to get the objective that you want accomplished, which is great. And I'm a, I'm a big fan. And yeah. it just, it solves stuff before it ever becomes a problem. Can't recommend it more. It's so much easier to solve the problems ahead of time proactively than it is to be like waist deep in an event and something comes up and someone goes, well, no one ever told me beforehand it was going to be like this. I've driven four hours to be here. Mm -hmm. And that quickly gets ugly. Like on one hand, they're right. You just wasted their time because they wouldn't have came if they would have known this. And, and there's a probably not a small part of you going, but yeah, but you're kind of being a jerk about this. And like, that's just an uncomfortable situation for everyone involved. And if you can avoid it, you should try to avoid it. Mm hmm. Agreed. And for the last part of logistics, I think the best advice we could give you, because it's all kind of, uh, personal for group and from like group to group and depending on where you're gaming depends on your challenges and whatnot but generally speaking start planning your logistics problems early think about them ahead of schedule and when you go to start planning them keep your schedule loose um i think we've all known people who like to really really hardcore plan stuff like down to the yeah. the 10 minute mark or something like that and they really get upset if their itinerary changes let me just tell you your itinerary is probably gonna change just is yeah uh, and the more people involved the more likely it is that things will change oh yeah yeah people are gonna hit traffic on the highway coming down might change your start time especially if they're driving from like four or five hours away where they're going through multiple spots that have traffic Times are going to change. Uh, your catering, they might just be late that day. They might have a super busy schedule. It's going to get there late. Or maybe it gets there early. Whatever. You're just going to have to be okay with this stuff moving around. Um, and the more willing you are to be loose and to be flexible, 
the easier it will be for you to adapt and just keep on playing. You know, if you're sort of tied up in your itinerary and you're too sort of uh, attached to it, if if the place that you were planning to do food from calls and says, I'm sorry, we're going to be an hour late, it's going to absolutely ruin your day. Because you had a schedule that food was here at 12.05. However, if you kind of went into this expecting stuff to change and they say that, you're just going to go, huh, that's cool. Well, people can play an extra hour of that game. That's cool. Whatever. Yep. And like, don't just try not to, like, we just talked a whole lot about planning stuff out, but don't over plan. Like, don't try to fit seven games into a period of time you know should only hold five. Because Mm -hmm. you want to try to get in as much as possible and you don't leave room for that kind of stuff. Because, like, people are going to go to the gas station. People are going to go get different food than the food you got. People are going to, like, the food might be late. People are going to stop and smoke a cigarette. People are going to do this. They're going to do that. And, like, nobody wants to go to one of these events and, like, one, like, the guy running the event's just like, uh, excuse me, you've been, you smoked a second cigarette and you're four minutes late for your next game. If you can't, um, get in there and play, your spot will be going to the next person. Like, that's just not a good time. Nah, man. Like, that just sucks. Get out of here. <laughs> Again, this is not a 500 person grand tournament. <laughs> like, yeah. Kiss my um, ass. <laughs> You like the whole point of like planning and setting up ahead of time is so that it's all done. So when it comes time for the we, the day of, it's just like plug and play. Let's go and not worry about it. Mm-hmm. It all will work itself out because you've done a little bit of grunt work on the front end. And y'all, if a lot of this is a whole lot of talking, okay, I get it. We've we've done a bunch of talking about this stuff. Yeah, we jabber jaw a lot on this show. You know, our talking show where we talk a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But <laughs> I I will say it's not as hard as it sounds, especially if you're in smaller numbers. We kind of have to hedge our bets going to the higher end of like casual get togethers of like 20 people. But a lot of these are like six to 10 people. And it's just easier at that point. It's much easier. It's much smaller. You probably know everybody who's coming. A lot, some of these concerns just solve themselves. So, I tell you, if you want to give this a try, or if you haven't done it before, I urge you to try to do so. Find a time that works for everybody, set it on the schedule, find a place to play, and just do it. It will be so fun. Uh, for me, it feels like I am fifteen or sixteen again, doing a land party. <laughs> Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. where everybody piles together, everybody's laughing and everybody's having a good time. You're staying up way too damn late, uh, except now you're staying up uber late compared to your age. Uh, you know, you're drinking garbage drinks, you're eating junk food, you're having great what was it? food. The last time we did this, it was like you, me, and Corbin were like, we get another game in, we could do it. We're all we're all getting old, but we can we can go past way past our bedtime. We're like, yeah. Let's head out into the store and let's uh, let's buy some energy drinks. <laughs> and we all just start drinking Monster at like 1 a.m. on a Saturday going, we got one more game in us, boys. <laughs> we stumbled at the house at 3.30 in the morning. Uh, all of our, like, my wife and Corwin's wife and uh, <laughs> John's girlfriend, all three asleep on the same inflatable mattress watching a murder documentary, and they had all passed out long before we got home. It was just fun to stumble yeah. in the door at 3 30 in the morning with a whole bunch of miniatures uh like you're a kid again you know it gives you that little taste of of being young for a little bit and just letting some of your stresses go and uh it really can like keep friend groups feeling fresh and together um because i don't know about y'all but like in covid it has all been electronic for quite a while and uh anything i can do to combat that i think is worth doing and a lot of people yeah. probably feel that way it's real it's real nice to get back to the analog like everything's so digital in this day and age but well, there we were playing warhammer analog no cell phones in sight <laughs> living in the moment thriving <laughs> <laughs> i mean we were looking at rules electronically man that's yeah, yeah, so absolutely. convenient absolutely <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's something to just being in person with uh like-minded folks and having a good time so please if you haven't tried it do so if you often do this 
Uh, maybe this will make your weekends a little better or a little more fun. Maybe it'll help you scale it up. Or maybe you do some stuff that we totally missed that make your weekends more fun. And if that's the yeah. case, I want to know. Like, I want to improve my fun weekends with people. So if you do have something like that, drop it in the comments if you're on the YouTube section. Or reach out to us on social media. Uh, send out your ideas to us, because let me tell you, we will implement it into our weekends. If you, we see something that's galaxy brain, oh, I'd love that. Big brain play. Yeah, big yeah. brain play. Love that, because we're pebble brains. So if you galaxy brain people can help us, we would awfully appreciate that. Yeah, we'll just rent out a whole Holiday Inn, fill it chock full of Warhammer in the, with a continental breakfast on the side. Oh my god, that sounds good. Oh, hell yeah, galaxy brain. Um, so much money. <laughs> for for <laughs> little, <laughs> little, little trade off. Or, uh, conversely, if maybe uh, you're going to take some of the stuff and you just got further questions, or maybe you got unique challenges with your group that you're not sure how to solve, reach out to us. We'll help you. We try to, at least. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do our best. Uh, we, we're, we're not know-it-alls. Uh, we don't know everything. And honestly, we don't know a whole lot of much about anything, but uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. Yeah, I mean, as the show start says, we aren't qualified to talk about anything. I guess I, I'm qualified to talk about birds. If you got a bird-related challenge, send it my way. Um, I think I'm qualified to talk about forklifts and, like, inventory systems, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your logistics problems. Yeah, send all that our way. We're on... Oh, uh, yeah, I do work in logistics. Whoops. <laughs> we're on Twitter. We're on Instagram. And, of course, the YouTube comment section down below. Uh, and for y'all out there listening to the show, give it a review or a like if you uh, wouldn't mind. It really helps the show we're trying to get it in front of more people but with being smaller it's just kind of hard to fight the algorithm uh so if you want to be a real champion of the show send it to a friend maybe you want to get together with some peeps send this episode to them and like have them listen to it put it on in the background uh, for us two doofy idiots for a little while and see if they're into the idea and if they are man that's your gateway in and they already know the expectations because they just listened to the episode that's the galaxy brain play <laughs> and it gets the show in front of more people and we'd really appreciate that uh we love bringing the show to you and we'd like to bring it to even more folks but for now i think that's been all of our opinions bona fide kentucky fried and we'll see y'all next time